will be in this conversation will be sort of talking about some recent advances on efficient long context models and in particular focusing on one family of, of approaches that relies on state space models and uh, long convolutions and so on uh, Aina being one of them uh, we'll sort of discuss a little bit how that connects to hungry and hungry hippos which is a, a previous uh, attempt and and so on so before going uh, to the, the meat the, the presentation, it's good to establish why we even care about long context in the first place. And it's easy to start from modalities that, that, that go beyond language and maybe code. Um, if you look at tasks involving, for example, biological data, uh, uh, DNA, genomics, then out of the box, if you want to process the whole human genome in one, uh, in, in one go, with global context, you need billions of context length, right? So human genome at the nucleotide level is 3.2 roughly uh, nucleotides. And so this, this appears something that's not really global with, with uh, transformers, uh, with current hardware, even if you employ the latest, all the latest tricks, optimized kernels, special tension, uh, blockwise occurrences, it just seems like something that's way, way out there. Um, even something a little bit more realistic than billions, talking about millions, which is now uh, a reality for many models, right? We have uh, many closed and open sort of research groups that have either um, released models or are interested in models at the billion, at the million uh, context length uh, scale. We're talking about AI, which is, has expressed interest in training one, uh, even though they have right now 32,000 with GPT-4. Uh, we're talking about uh, Magic, which is a startup in the, in the uh, AI models for code space, which has announced a, a, a non-transformer model, uh, excitingly enough. Um, uh, which reaches 5 million context length. So there is definitely interest uh, even in, in language and code. And, and why? Well, we know that, that this, this sort of additional space in the input is, is really useful for many, <laughs> many applications. Uh, it's, it's how we, we teach, how we control the model in, in many places, how we instruct it to follow um, a set of rules uh, in a way that's usually hidden from the API, from the end user. It's how we pack information for a specific task. If we have an agent model that, that's supposed to help you do something, we, we pack you know, some information in there. Maybe it's, it's supposed to call an API for you, then we, we may pass an API reference and so on. So it's clearly one of the ways uh, along with uh, retrieval-based methods that would allow us to, to have more uh, grounded uh, sort of models, LLMs that are more grounded in, in reality. So. The problem is that uh, transformers are quadratic in sequence length. So, uh, what do we do? Um, so let's let's establish some uh, notation. This is the token attention self attention slide that you may have seen hundreds of times. Uh, I apologize, but we use we have this slightly different way of writing it, uh, which highlights one of the properties of attention that we that we think is very important, uh, namely the data uh, dependence, the data control. We call it. And so we, we tend to write it in, in, in two steps. First, you form the attention matrix, A of U, where U is an input sequence, L by D. L, L is the sequence length, D is the, the width, the embedding dimension. And you have this familiar operation where you take a row Y, softmax, of, uh, each entry of this matrix is formed by a bunch of dot products between projections of the input. These learnable weight matrices optionally rescaled by uh, the, the so that I mentioned this top product. Um, once you form this matrix, then you can you can talk about a linear value to output map essentially, um, where you have a value that's another projection, and then you just take this this matrix vector of multiplication. And it's kind of interesting because if you just look at the value to output, it's a linear operation, but obviously it's it's nonlinear in in U, in the input, uh, which also is how you get value. And and we find and so this is knowledge that uh, permeates the field. Uh, this data dependence is exactly how you enable uh, in context learning, for example. If you remove this, if you strip away uh, this, this on the fly formation of the operator, then you lose in context learning. So it's definitely very important. What, what other properties does attention have that are important? If, if we seek like, to build a, a new a variant of these models, an alternative to, to transformers that doesn't use up attention from the ground up, we need a sort of objectives. And so data control seems like a natural one that we, we may want. Right? If, if we want the model to scale similarly, to do context learning, to do all these nice things, we need to, to, to have data control. 
we also want the the context size to be unrestricted meaning once it's specified you want any two embeddings in the input sequence to be able to talk to each other to exchange information so we don't want any uh say a, a priori zero doubt entries in the entries in this matrix essentially um this is something that you would get if you took another route to efficient attention variance and you looked at things like uh, big bird right fixed patterns uh, transformers efficient attention where they assume that some uh, some masks basically of a are most important and some others don't matter and so you, you basically a priori zero out some entries we don't want that we want anything to to be able to communicate we also don't, don't want to scale uh, too heavily in parameters uh, we particularly want to scale sublinearly in sequence length uh, this is because again if we go to a million then it's clear that we, we can really have millions of parameters just for the for the uh, uh, sequence length mixing operation in a multi-layer uh, network this is simply not scalable um, interestingly that's the property that, that attention definitely has because the only parameters in attention are the projection uh, parameters and those are applied <clears throat> um, so th those are way tied across the sequence um, and so the scaling is certainly sub sublinear uh, what we don't want to inherit is the quadratic line complexity so ideally we, we wouldn't want to uh, compute this matrix explicitly before computing the, um, the matrix vector product even like in a tile fashion we just we just want to evaluate this efficiently and also we'd like to have a per step uh, time that's independent of of the sequence length uh, so this is for generation workloads <clears throat> if we're looking to generate also long sequences we don't want this cost to increase and for transformers this cost increases linearly because we use what's called a, a kv cache a very simple idea where we essentially we, we reuse the projections from previous steps and we only update with the latest uh, projection we essentially just need the last row of the attention matrix and this makes the cost linear uh, in, in sequence length we want this to be constant ideally and so we need we need some kind of recurrent method uh, to achieve this this linear cost <clears throat> okay so aina is the latest in a, a whole line of work um what we take is a different approach and we we try to design an operator that has all these properties just from from simple and you know, grounded design principles we don't try to take attention and approximate that we just go from you know, from zero to to a layer and we end up with something that, that has a similar data control form so you can write some attention surrogate matrix h of u which we'll see what it is uh, but we don't we never form it during during inference so it's always an implicit uh representation of your layer that you can use to visualize to inspect what it's doing so you can form h after training to see what it does um to have some kind of similar um, interpretation but you can apply similar interpretability ideas as like looking at the attention weights and so on but you never actually do it during training and it's it's it, in particular this h is comprised is composed of of fast linear operators so things that you can evaluate uh, fire quickly um and so we we address these these challenges but also uh, you know on the way keep data control and so on and so on all these properties okay so this is the rough idea on the, on the game plan but we need to first contextualize uh, the, this this work uh, in the space of uh, how the many efficient attention variants. Uh, this is taken from from an amazing survey, um, very recent survey also up to date on on all the possible ways you can you can think about the, this problem of getting a better uh, model in terms of scaling in in, uh, in computational scaling in sequence length. And this paper that, that this survey does a great job at clustering these methods into underlying principles um we briefly mentioned the fixed uh the fixed uh, pattern idea like big bird which is a uh, still a fairly popular baseline in many applications um there are many other things uh, recurrences baked in block recurrences or uh, sparsity we are going to look at low, low rank ideas which are sort of the closest uh, in spirit to what we're doing and in particular the family of linear attention methods and, and all, all the similar approaches regardless of this similar so if, if if we had to chart these new models somewhere in there we we put them way to the left somewhat close to low rank methods but still away uh, in, in terms of venn diagram we 
argue that it's it's it, it might be good to start over in the sense that it, it hasn't been terribly fruitful to start with attention and seek approximations. Uh, so the methods that we end up with typically under underperform uh, dense attention by a lot. So is it really that transformers the self attention is the best? Very unlikely. How do we find something something else? Let's just start from 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 zero. Let's not try to. to, to approximate attention. And so we have this, we're calling it the safari of long sequence models for fun because it involves a bunch of animals. We have hyenas, hippos, uh, temporary name. But basically the idea is to use um, uh, the latest uh, methods for long uh, context, long memory that we know work well for long memory. So SSM based approaches, long convolution, implicit, implicit long convolutions, we'll see what those are. Approaches like CKConf that have been developed specifically at the, at the layer level. Uh, for these things, and then some ideas from efficient transformers together. So there, there are it's going to be a slightly higher level of, of, of uh, abstraction in some sense. Combines these two in a block, and these blocks scale as well as transformers. <laughs> okay, um, let's just see what linear attention is quickly, and and some interesting uh, recent variants like RWKV that you 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 for sure heard about. It's it's, it's been everywhere. Um, Let's look at the scalar version of attention. So each uh, U is a is a sequence of, of L scalars now for simplicity. So we don't have to think about uh, dot products and, and transposes. We just look at uh, multiplications. <clears throat> we have projections, uh, parameterized projections. And then we have this uh, form where we, we write the, the equation for a single output, the output sequence. And we also use this kernel-like uh, function of phi, which takes two entries and then computes some score these two, these two uh, scalar entries. If you use the exponential um, function, then you get exactly the, the dense attention, self-attention combination. But you essentially have, for one output, you have a weighted combination of, of, of V, which is also a sequence, a dimensional sequence. So you take this dot product over L. And the weights of this, of this aggregation, this reduction, uh, come to you from this uh, similarity function. You take QT and then you multiply that uh, by the k, uh, the k sequence, and you solve max. You normalize. Uh, we we said this is very expressive. It's computation expensive, All right? So, Laurent in attention says something very simple. What this method says is that instead of phi a b, you decompose into phi prime a times phi prime b, or even two different things, phi prime a and psi of b. We have used phi prime for, for both, but in practice, they're typically different. And if you factorize this way, it's a very simple idea, you can take this term out of the sum, right? Because it doesn't depend on d. And, and you just rewrite this thing. Basically, you, 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 you redefine beta t. You ignore the fact that you can simplify this because it's only because it's scalar. Uh, so you redefine beta t to be this thing, uh, this running normalization thing at the bottom. And then you, you end up with this, which is cool because now you, you've expressed this operation as a sequence of sub operations um, that do something uh, conceptually very simple. One of them computes the reduction, so some kind of aggregation of the history. This will be your long, your memory module in some sense. You have a normalization to ensure this whole thing is, uh, is doesn't blow up for long sequences. And then you have the gating. So this term is just an element twice thing. Once you've re reduced this to a scalar, then you just element twice multiply. Typically, this phi prime uh, out here would be an, a, an activation function, like a sweet glue or value or, or whatever. <clears throat> Problem is, if you, for typical choices of phi prime for the reduction, you get very big gaps in language modeling. So if you just try linear attention, attention-free transformers, all those things, you tend to use some form of exponential here with a with a suboptimal parameterization. And if you just train those, you get a full perplexity, which is the gap from between a 125 million model on the pile and, and I think a 2.7 billion model. It's it's a fairly big gap that you get. <clears throat> so what else can you do? WKV is you can think about a WKV as something in between. Um, Aina, H3, and linear attention. We, if we find it helpful to, uh, to, to put it along, along that line. And AWKV does two very interesting things. One is they notice that the first model that notices 
um, that you can improve performance by changing the projections. And they do so by having, by introducing this basically, um, this com linear combination of current token and previous token, right? So it doesn't, QT is that doesn't depend any longer only on UT, but it depends also on UT minus one. And it, this might seem like a mind of completely useless change, but it actually changes everything. This is the, maybe the most important uh, we find uh, idea about WKB. And interestingly, we found, we wrote a blog post on this, um, the Hazy Research uh, website recently. This finds a, you can find a connection between this and the induction heads work from on top, which is really cool. They propose, they show a bunch of things about these induction circuits, these induction heads form in transformers that allow them to do completion, basically, or fuzzy completion, A, B. And then if you, if you get A again, the model somehow learns to pull B, the token B, the embedding for the token B again. And to do a completion, uh, this is they, they find this is explains a lot of the performance uh, of transformers, but this can be done by a single layer transformer. You need two layers, uh, you need two heads to work in in in, in sequence to form an induction circuit. Um, if if you introduce a changed parameter to the projections, uh, they call it a smeared key variant, which is exactly that. It's the same thing as as here uh, for the keys only. Uh, then you, you allow a one layer transformer to, to form induction heads. And they show that this helps in a bunch of different ways. So it's kind of cool that, that this is the same principle and it helps these, these uh, efficient uh, transformers do very well also on, on in context learning tasks. Uh, so this is the first change. The second change is you see some of these ch particular choices of our WKV for the two factorization terms. <clears throat> one of them is an exponential, but it's, it's parameters in a particular way. So it's, it's an exponential that decays in time, so here alpha is, is a function of, of, of TNT prime that I didn't write, but basically there's 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 a forgetting factor. So yt, uh, the, the terms that go T prime that goes back into the past are weighted by something that's smaller and smaller and smaller as you go further back. And the you can write, this is also something we show in the blog post. This is precisely, uh, for those that are already familiar with SSMs, I'll just throw this in. Uh, this is precisely, uh, you can write the convolutional form of this. This is precisely an SSM, but it's a scalar SSM. So our WKV is basically an H3 model in some sense with, with a single state per channel. Uh, it's fine if this doesn't make any sense, but if, if it does, uh, uh, I think that, that would clarify quite a bit. Okay. Instead, um, we, we go further. So we, we try to, 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 uh, to generalize all of these operations and, and find why they're working and, and how we can make them better, more efficient. And so we get something that, that looks like this, a block that looks like this for, for AENA, where you still have the concept of projections. projections. You still use um, some aggregation over the past in the projections. This is really important. So not a specific form, but you do, um, we use short convolutions for that. So this allows very shallow layers, uh, very shallow AENA models to do in context learning, for example, to learn, to do arithmetic and all kinds of interesting things. And then we use these projections to parameterize that H of U matrix that we saw before in a particular way that does both gating in time and gating in frequency domain. So it's both local in time and, and global in time in some sense. Okay, this was all the preamble and we'll get into the details. Um, <clears throat> So data control, um, why is it that we do data control in the way transformers do, other than the fact that we, we understand that well now? Uh, why don't we use something else? So the simplest thing to do, one of the simplest things to do would be to build the A matrix using a deep ralu network. Right? One of the first deep learning primitives that we study in introductory deep learning classes. You say, okay, you stack uh, linear, linear layers and some kind of activation function, and, and this has all kinds of interesting properties or other activation functions. It's a universal function approximator. So uh, we know it does things. You can also build the A matrix with this chain of, of, of this model, right? Uh, you simply need to map an L sequence to an L by L matrix and be then a, a reshaping operation, but that's, that's besides the point. You can do this and to my knowledge, this hasn't been done. Uh, we're pretty sure this would do also in context learning or, or interesting things. The problem is this doesn't scale well at all. This is worse than quadratic. It's got a terrible constant because you have all these layers, right? You're mapping an L-dimensional sequence to an L-squared uh, sequence uh, through all these layers. 
but it's interesting that we <clears throat> that we could do other things in principle right there's no there's, there's nothing um stopping us from uh imagine that this would approximate whatever uh, data control attention implements with a specific form of dot products right so um but we can do this so can we do something that's similar um and to do something that's similar we need to use this concept of uh, a fast linear operator from linear from numerical linear algebra which is a, let's talk about the finite dimensional case so we're talking about matrices it's a matrix that has a fast eigen decomposition so in practice this means that um and each each decomposition of the of, of this eigen composition each matrix in the in the decomposition can be evaluated uh quickly meaning you can do matrix vector products uh, quickly in this quadratic time um in practice this means um uh, that whatever you basically define an implicit decomposition of that h of u whatever that may be you choose a class of class linear operators and then you when you need to evaluate when u comes in the sequence you can evaluate each uh matrix times u uh, matrix vector product very quickly without ever materializing the whole thing you never compute the, the matrix uh, matrix matrix products that, that would form h other than if you want to visualize what h is um, convolutions are one choice that we use for these layers uh, they're not the only choice interestingly there's a lot of, of, of very powerful uh, fast linear operators convolutions are natural because they we've used them in deep learning for, for decades uh, machine learning for decades signal processing for even longer and the eigen, eigen decomposition for convolutions um, comes out when you write the uh, the matrix form of a convolution. So I'll skip one slide, one second to show you this. <clears throat> so this is a convolution between two sequences in in in, in series form, in some form. It turns out that you can always write the convolution in in this matrix vector form. You collect the entries of the the convolutional kernel or filter U. You collect them uh, and you you place them along the rows of this uh, uh, matrix. That's called a Toeplitz uh, matrix. Uh, where you you notice there is a shift by one so it's there's like a staircase structure basically <clears throat> this is the matrix that we, we're looking at right now and we say okay this matrix has a, a fast eigen composition and this comes from the Fourier convolution theorem it's another way it's a, it's a restatement of the same object so if you want to compute that matrix t times u <clears throat> you can compute you can first uh, decompose and then compute each piece and the p the pieces that give you this decomposition are WL, which is the, the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform matrix. <clears throat> I've written here the formula, but so it doesn't really matter. This is the, the, the definition of Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform. <clears throat> then you have a diagonal matrix, which you can also compute. Uh, you can now evaluate very efficiently because that, that's just elementwise multiplication. But the entries of the diagonal are the, the Fourier transform of the filter, right? So you need to compute this thing as well, but that's no problem because we com can compute this efficiently. We know how to compute discrete Fourier transforms quickly with a fast Fourier transform algorithm, and then we have you have an inverse DFT matrix, so you can use the inverse fa uh, fast Fourier transform algorithm. So all in all, you, you just do all these pieces, and uh, your your bottleneck would be the fast Fourier transform, which is um, uh, a log L in 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 uh, in cost in runtime. And there are many methods. We've recently we're sort of going down a fairly deep rabbit hole. Um, how you map this efficiently to current hardware because these methods have um, they they're memory bound they do a lot of uh, IO operations and so even though you get better asymptotic complexity that might not always give you the same um, GPU utilization so the same training throughput as something simpler like a, like a, a simple matrix vector multiplication that's dense um, we'll see the, the benchmarking data but this is an interesting point to make um, so yeah, we choose this uh, this 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 thing right here. But how do you parameterize H? So this is very important. Um, we don't just use the explicit way to parameterize convolutional filters. This is uh, what we've been trained to do from again the first deep learning courses. Where we're, we're told about CNNs, convolutional neural networks. They say okay, you specify some filter length, and then you train each value of the filter. That's your parameter. We can do that because that scales linearly in the number of parameters, right? And so, if we want to process billions of, of uh, sequences of billions of entries or millions, that's not really a doable uh, thing. 
ignoring the fact that it's it's and there are also aspects related to to trainability of these approaches so even if you could parameterize a long convolution we have a work on on, on this called simple um, long convolutions where we try this we try to match ssms uh, this is by by my uh, friend and collaborator dan and, and and others they basically they started with the, the idea of trying to match uh, ssms s4 attack methods performance along sequences with, with an explicit parameterization so just learning the filters, they found that you need a lot of, sort of tricks, regularization terms to make it work. It can work, but then, but then again, you have a memory, um, a memory limitation at some point. That's quite, quite interesting. There's a lot of work in this space. Um, we want something that's sublinear in, in sequence length in terms of parameters, and but we want it to have a filter that's very long, that's as long as the sequence. So we, we sort of hit a conundrum, because if you don't have a filter that's as long as the sequence, then if you look at the receptive context uh, size, the receptive field of this convolution, for example, by taking, you can just look at the derivatives of the output with respect to inputs that are far in, in the past, you want this to be non-zero. So you want some dependence in a single layer, but it turns out that if you take this derivative here, you just get the, the jth entry of the filter. So if the, if the filter is shorter than j, then we sort of hit a conundrum. So do you need j parameters to have a j long uh, context length? No, you can use an implicit parameterization for convolutions. And this is as opposed to explicit where you parameterize each entry and you learn that. You learn a compressed version um, that generates the, the whole filter in a particular way. And so what does that even mean? State spaces are one approach to, to parameterize uh, filters implicitly, or at least can be viewed as that. <clears throat> so in state space models, um, you define an underlying recurrence an implicit recurrence on some hidden state that you don't particularly care about, x, of some dimension that you pre-specify. And this is also this can also be viewed as a linear element. If you prefer, this is a continue the discrete time, time invariant system uh, from control theory and signal processing. But it's basically the same idea. You have uh, you have other parameters here, A, B, C, D. A is your state to state transition matrix, B is your input to state. Uh, vector matrix if it's a BMO system C is a, a vector matrix and D is your basically the, the, the residual term U, so UT goes into YT weighted by T and so if you learn A, B, C, D and you choose some form of them you choose a dimension of X which in turn determines a, a dimension of A then uh, you can compute filters you end up with filters that <clears throat> are as long as you need them to be but the number of parameters doesn't change because there's nothing here um, in the sizes of A, B, C, D that depends on the sequence length, right? How do you get a convolutional filter? The, the only thing you need to do is you need to write uh, the uh, input to output post form map analytically. And you can do this because this is a linear thing. It's a linear recurrence. So this is why you need linear RNNs to do this. And you can use all um, non-linear RNNs with gating all over the place. If you write this map, then you have a, a residual term. And it turns out that the other term uh, that uses the input uh, is exactly a convolution. Right? So it's a convolution between this thing, C transpose A, T minus J minus one, T minus one, B, and, and U. <clears throat> so yeah, this, this, this is how you parameterize your H if you choose an SSM or an S4 approach. So it's like a constrained parameterization that allows you to do a lot of interesting things at scale without many parameters. Right? And basically, this four line of work studies uh, different choices of, of A mostly. Um, and the latest insights are that you only need a diagonal matrix. So essentially, you need decoupled systems, decoupled states that are initialized in a particular way. You find this in the also, there's another paper um, by DeepMind, <clears throat> which involves the Albert, the first author of um, uh, the lead author of, of the S4 line of work, that, where they define basically the minimum set of properties of the, this approach that you need to, to do well on long context if you choose to use this. Now, the interesting something interesting to point out is that this is basically, you're choosing some, uh, you're forming your H as, as a combination of, of uh, basis functions, basically. You see like here, you, you essentially collapse in this to an entry and you have, it's a choice that you have. And so this may or may not represent all the things you care about. Uh, there's other deep, deep learning. If you look around, there are many ways to parameterize convolutions, and they all have different properties. If you heard about Fourier neural operators, there's just another way to 
to parameterize convolutions in a very interesting way. So you have a, an insight that you may want to parameterize them in frequency domain directly. So it's an explicit parameterization in frequency domain. It's another way you could use that here as well. And we, we have some, some ablations um, to try and do these different approaches. You can also s s take the implicit idea further and you can say, uh, similarly to neural fields, silence, nerves, where they take, they, they have some da data point and they want to learn that, to parameterize that as some map from positional uh, inputs. So indices basically, or positional encoding or space and time to the values of this uh, function. So you can view an image as, as basically a function that maps from grid indices to the values, the RGB values. And, and, and that line of work is, concerns, uh, is concerning uh, uh, compression applications mostly. But they have interesting parameterizations for these maps. And one can say the same thing about these kernels. You can view them as this function from time to the value of the filter. And you can you can try to parameterize it this way instead of choosing this a priori structure of, of S4. <clears throat> With Aina, we do this. And this is this continues on the line of work, CKCOM, VestGCOM, where you learn these uh, this more freeform maps from time, position encoding on time. With Aina, we, we use this structure where we have a position encoding of time. We use um, uh, complex exponential encoding, so sinusoidal basic uh, encodings of T. We pass that through an MLP that's also weight tied across time. Right? And, and then we apply an elementwise modulation with an exponential window. So you get something like this, just to, to give you intuition. When you apply the, FF, the MLP to the position encoding, you get something very expressive. And then when you modulate, you get something uh, that has this, you know, has decay in time but may capture, depending on the sizes, may capture uh, things that go beyond SSMs. <clears throat> and recently we've tried to characterize exactly what, what this space looks like. So this is very delicate uh, balance between expressivity and trainability. And SSMs have a very, uh, have a very interesting balance where they're not extremely, um, given a small state space, uh, they're not extremely expressive. They can represent a lot of things, but they're not as, as expressive as something like this. But they're very, very uh, stable, well trainable. So uh, we'll see uh, in this what, how this space evolves. But we use this this approach, and <clears throat> with this, we have basically completed uh, our, tour, our tour on how to parameterize the the long memory module in in our decomposition of H of U. Uh, turns out that that's one piece. The other pieces that you have that I showed you before are gating in time. So use the other two projections to do gating in time. And if you do this a bunch of times, you end up with the AINA. Okay. That's basically the, the whole idea. <clears throat> um, convolution is, you can view that as gating in frequency domain. So it's somewhat sat satisfactory to view this, this operation as gating in time as, and gating in frequency domain, if, if you so prefer, if you're a signal processing inclined. Um, but that's, that's the whole idea. And you have, if you go back to the properties, we have all the properties. We have data control, we have global context, efficient, blah, blah, blah. What we don't have is, um, we don't have is constant per step time because we don't have a recurrent mode. Whereas you have a recurrent mode in, in state spaces. So you can switch from this convolution to this recurrence at any point you, you'd like. With the freeform approach, you don't, you don't have that. And with, uh, with recent work that will come out over the summer, we've addressed some of these issues. Um, and, and, and sort of gone beyond this, this parameterization. Okay, so what we end up with is this. Right? This is your attention replacement. H of U is a chain of S, uh, as these S matrices are the top its matrices. So recall that's the equivalent formulation of the convolution that you evaluate with that decomposition you do, and you parameterize it uh, implicitly with that form. And then the D matrices are just diagonals where you, you place a projection of the input on the diagonal. So this is gating in time and this is gating in frequency domain. And you do this a bunch of times. Um, if you visualize H, you find we have a bunch of these in the paper. You find that it learns very, very uh, expressive patterns that somewhat match uh, the, the, what you expect from attention. If you visualize attention matrices before, um, you have these um, sort of very interesting, very specific sparsity patterns that, that, um, that come up. Even though it is, it is a, in some sense, it is a, a it comes from a particular structure, particular decomposition. 
of, of the matrix. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a good time to maybe slow down for a second for questions. I have a bunch of results. I have potentially slides on uh, follow-up work. Um, yeah, if, if there are any questions, something that wasn't clear, some mistakes, I'm happy to, to discuss. If not, I'll go, I'll go. So folks, please feel free to speak up or raise your hand. Let's maybe give Captain and Trips the right questions. Yeah, uh, Rene, please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to ask you about the exponential decay again. Mm -hmm. So it's necessary to uh, have uh, the exponential decay all the time. Right, so <clears throat> this is, um, I will tell you what our best uh, intuition this is. Uh, we don't have full certainty as you often, and we still don't have certainty about many choices in the transform architecture, so uh, we'll try our best. So what I can tell you is that one uh, on the set of synthetics that we that we'll see briefly, that we used to evaluate, um, and that we see somewhat correlate with performance on the pile at a larger scale. <clears throat> no windowing also worked, but train slower. So this may affect, it may just be that this affects uh, trainability, especially when you go to longer sequences. It may have, it may be more um, related to some form of initialization than something you actually want your filter to be like at the end. Although we have, we know that often you want there's like this idea, <clears throat> idea that forgetting is is uh, is critical, right? All these papers about Arena and Sebastian so say uh, forgetting is critical for me, it's a decay. We don't know the degree to which that is true. So we you can train without this. It may be more unstable. Uh, it may also be that it works better in longer context if you can tame uh, the instability with other like more careful optimization um, uh, schedule and all that. Uh, for RWKV, what I would be, because RWKV is basically a combination of these two ideas, right? It's it's linear tension with a decay and the uh, the smeared key idea for the projections. I don't know that anyone has done an ablation on just if you take linear tension and you just do the smeared key thing and then you you take away the exponential <clears throat> decay if that does as well as RWKV or not. Um, is a fairly new architecture, so I'm sure, I'm sure someone will uh, will clarify these. Yeah. yeah thanks. And mm, could you please tell more uh, about the number of these uh, layers? Uh, these, because it uh, seems like versions? yeah, this separation because it seems like uh, not uh, a deep uh, network, but more like um, wide network, so how wide could be? Yeah, so this is an interesting. So this is, uh, I think it's 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 this a form of depth. So it's it's basically a depth within one block. Um, we typically use. Um, we found that for language, um, we didn't need more than two, uh, and even even just one long convolution. So you get something like the initial block that I showed you. We have two gates and and uh, an encomb, um, and so this this becomes a it becomes a, so this is like the H three architecture with uh, modified projections, which we found were really important and a different parameterization of long Um H three itself, for those that are familiar with H three, is is a longer um, recurrence what I'm recurrence in terms of uh, steps here than say gated state spaces so there's even this other paper where they take one gate and one long comb parameters with SSMs and that would just be basically doing the, the like two of these steps or the last two of these steps so h3 basically adds another thing and then ch changes the some parameterization we change the parameterization further and we generalize this this idea we found <clears throat> that a language say in wiki text you could get better um, results by going to three, for example, 
we didn't pursue this, um, like we know, so there are classical results that tell you that many matrices can be approximated by a chain of diagonal matrices and totalist matrices, circular matrices. There are this very classical structure in algebra theory that tells you uh, that this thing will, will do better and better at, at being general. The issue for, for deep learning is that uh, for evaluation, as, and the reason why we didn't pursue this at, at, at that moment, because we had too many moving pieces, is that if you increase the number of steps here, you're also somewhat increasing the overall depth of the model in, in some in some sense, the change in the number of parameters. So it becomes very tricky to evaluate things um, well. So especially because we don't, you know, even just <clears throat> parameter matching that we do in the, in the literature is extremely messy. It's, it's a wrong thing to do, but it's what we do. And so it, it becomes difficult to justify. But we know for first principles, we know that it would work better. And there's also another point which you mentioned with, that's also an insight in the sense that um, these projections are done essentially in parallel. And it is unclear, we're, we're investigating that now, it is unclear how many projections you can do in parallel. Like say, say the whole model is <clears throat> was just a pure long IENA recurrence of, of these steps. How many times do you need to stop and then basically have another branching point for your projections along this long recurrence versus having them all at the beginning and then just feeding through the recurrence. Your whole network is just one block like this with maybe some residual connections or whatever. Um, it seems that there's, there's a trade-off because ideally you'd want everything in parallel for uh, algorithm utilization and everything, but it's not gonna be the best. So there's some trade-off and that is quite complicated. So you're right that it's, there is some width in, in here, basically some parallelism, but it's also depth. Uh, I hope that didn't confuse the thing further, but it's still open. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, while we are talking about the architecture uh, and the details, I wanted to ask one more question. Uh, sure. When you're talking about time and memory complexity, you're writing it with respect to the sequence length right. everywhere, but there are other parameters like hidden size, for example, and uh, for sure. modern large transformers, like very large transformers, uh, the yeah, scaling problem, takes over, right? yeah, it takes over because the attention takes only like 15, 20% of uh, time and uh, the rest is feed forward layers, which are scaling as uh, L times D squared because D is very large. And so yeah. what is I'm, the, I'm totally, uh, the totally space good. and time complexity with respect to other parameters? Right. Because I guess we, all, we also noticed that sometimes we are running out of memory earlier than we would expect with uh, the linear memory scaling? Yeah, so this is a great question. Obviously, we've, um, we've addressed some of this in the blog post. Uh, yes, once you go beyond the superficial thing to say, it's quadratic in a sequence length. It's, sort of, it's one la layer of abstraction, but then if you actually train large models, you find these other things. So th this operator is quadratic in, in model width, in D, let's call it D because of the, the projections, mm -hmm. regardless of whether you have an MLP after. So the whole AINA block would be an AINA operator and an MLP similar to a decoder on the transformer block. Or you could just stack AINA operators. Regardless of what you do, you have projections that make you quadratic in, in D. Um, so I, there's a lot, really a lot to say here, um, starting from the fact that the evaluations that we have for efficiency in the literature are, are miscalibrated because of the reasons you list. Um, first thing is that if you go to millions of sequence length, then you no longer have this um, this D taking over. Uh, this is just something that happens unless you plan on training trillion uh, <laughs> models. So there's kind of a switch in um, in the relative weights. If you, if you go to long enough sequences, then the, the quadratic term in L for a transformer take, will take over the, the other term. It is true that this also makes the, the D square term worse because projection will be D square L. So if you make L much, much longer then that also uh, causes issues. So our final goal, um, <clears throat> we love benchmarks for like a reasonable size. Um, 
and you find that basically there's a, a you, you need a sequence length to be above 2k 4k for this to start being much faster and then it gets way way faster uh, for like a 1 billion model say um, but ideally we would want to address the quadratic scaling in the projections too but the problem um, is that hmm? yes so just to clarify uh how does it impact the memory consumption so do you have to store something of l times d squared size at any point or is it L times D? Because obviously you have to store L times D because you have basically the embedding of the sequence. But do you have like any other terms in the inter in the memory computation? Uh, no, we have so the, the projections will be the same as, as transformers in in here. We don't mm -hmm. have any anything uh, else. Okay. Cool. 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 Right, the, so the the let's say the the um, once you go through, let's look at SH, for example, you go through here, you, you're materializing the basically the filters and the filters you'd have D filters of size L, that would be just uh, the L. And then you're computing for the base version of AENA. So there are no heads, nothing. It's or, or rather you can think, think of that as having D heads, another way to say that. We're looking into other uh, formulations that have heads. Um, H3, I proposed one way to do it. Um, you, you're doing D long convolutions in parallel. So you have D L, D log L computational, approximately the same as memory cost for this term. For the gating, it's the same. Like gating is just, uh, just linear. And the projections are basically the same cost as transformers. So mem we find the memory goes down uh, even with flash attention, which is also linear in uh, sequence length. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, cool. And uh, the second question also related to complexity here. So when you're doing the fast Fourier transform, yes. So do you have uh, everywhere actually linear scale, or do you have logarithms uh, also popping up here and there? Um, yeah, when we so when we compute S U and we we use the Fourier convolution theorem basically to implicitly decompose this, when you do W L U, uh, you're doing you're essentially doing an FFT, uh, and the FFT is is as you say a uh, uh, log L, so it's not completely linear. It's very close to linear for pretty much any value that we we care about. Uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to say something uh, something else. There are other options. So if you use a um, if you use a recurrent formulation already for the parametrization and for the implicit parametrization, so you use an SSM or or something that can be written as a as a recurrence, then as a linear recurrence, then you can use um, uh, parallel scans to to do this. Uh, so there's there are other classes of algorithms to compute this efficiently. And those uh, we found uh, a paper that discusses this is the S5 paper uh, in other contexts. Uh, so if you use S5 within a, a, you know, let's say you and use a parallel scan, we find that that maps better uh, to met better utilization on the current set of hardware options that we have. Mostly because GPUs, like if you use PyTorch and you call them FFT, the FFT calls the QFFT API of NVIDIA, which was optimized for other things. and. We're working on that too with NVIDIA, but uh, it's not currently the, the best. So you may pay a little bit of a quality hit by just using a, a less expressive parameterization, but it may just, if you care about only scaling and having the best utilization on your giant cluster, then you may want to use an S5 type thing with within this, this block. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for Verifying all of this. Awesome. Uh, um, oops. If there are no further questions, maybe let's carry on because it's, we it's might run out of time. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna jump through the results, but then uh, feel free to reach out. I'll give you the email at the end. For okay. So how do we evaluate this this thing? Um, 
we have some success in designing a smaller set of syntactics. We call them mechanistic design uh, tasks that we found were correlated with pre-training loss and perplexity on the pile. And so this was useful doing uh, model design to do some ablations and so on. Some of these tasks come from the induction head line of work. So associative recall, for example, tests the ability of your model to pull information back from the sequence. You have a, a chain, you have a sequence of key value uh, tuples, and then at the end you have a key and you ask the model to go back and find the corresponding key and then take the value after, basically. And each sequence comes from a different dictionary, so you can just memorize uh, the, the whole thing. And then we have other, uh, other tasks that are supposed to test slightly different uh, capabilities of the model. So we use them just to look at what the state of, of affairs is. So we know that linear tension doesn't do as well, and this would be a AFT, doesn't do as well as a transformer. And H3 already used something similar on recall to find this gap with another approach, a gated the GSS approach <clears throat> on smaller sequence lengths. So they looked at smaller sequence lengths, smaller vocabulary sizes. They found that there's a gap and they proposed a essentially modified projection that, that adjust that we go beyond. So the, the interesting thing about these tasks is that you can tune the difficulty uh, by sequence length and vocabulary size at on. And this is what we end up with. So there's an interesting, there are many interesting things we could say here. Transformers struggle to do this very simple task, which should definitely be within their capabilities. If you go to longer sequence lengths, even so, even just ignoring computational complexity for a second, there's something about trainability of longer sequence lengths. And we know that transformers. Um, have struggled, for example, historically to do well at path X, long range, some of the long range arena tasks, even with flash attention that allows them to do that. Um, and this is for sure something that's fixable with uh, careful tuning of the optimizer. It's just that um, it's something interesting to, to point out that if you, if you take default uh, default training uh, parameters. Uh, so there's there may be something else other than just you know, saying transformers are the best thing if you have infinite compute uh, or not. There are other things at play. Aina, Aina can scale to longer sequences. It does this task pretty, pretty well. We also ablate different options for the long convolution parameterization, SSMs, uh, CKCOM style approaches. I don't have time to tell you exactly what all these are, but we, we do a similar ablation in vocabulary size and sequence length. Um, I should say that recently, uh, someone from the S5 group tried Aina S5 in the similar recall, and they managed to solve this task as well as Aina. So our current opinion is that there, there are probably uh, a few different parameter, parameterizations of the long convolution that can solve the task at these sequence lengths. We're not sure about if you go to a million. Uh, the, uh, we suspect that there would be gaps that uh, come up. Um, but this is the this involves careful design of the memory module, basically. And it is important if you want to use the context. So this, again, this is accuracy in recall at different settings. Then yeah, we actually train language models. Um, we do scaling ablations on, we just do different training runs for five, 10, 15 million tokens on the pile. Um, we're training larger models actually now as we speak with the, um, the Red Pyjama team. Uh, we find that there's interesting um, efficiency gap in training flops. Uh, so this may be, this is definitely not conclusive. Uh, I mean, we know how much discussion there's been on the scaling laws, Chinchilla scaling laws. It may just be that there's the data efficiency component to this. Uh, it's the optimization hyperparameters. Uh, GPT, we just took the default GPT-3 uh, uh, hyperparameters. And we use actually we use the same for AENA. So it's kind of interesting that we observe this gap. It's not conclusive, but we'll see. But uh, at least we can say that AENA is approximately uh, the same as transformers, similar size in perplexity on natural language. So that's what we can say. And then benchmarking, uh, we, we looked at, I believe this was for um, a 768 uh, dimensional, so D60, uh, 768, so the width of a 125 roughly million model of a single layer. Um, we look at the runtime, actual actual runtime compared to flash attention. And, and you see that this is an inset up to this point, so roughly 3, 4K. Um, you have the overhead of, of the FFT basically uh, making you slightly slower. This is still a very small gap. 
then if you go beyond, if you go to 16K, 8K, 16K, 32K, uh, because the asymptotics kick in, um, you hide the overhead and then you, you go you know, much faster, 10X, 20X, 100X, again, depending on you know the ratio of D to L, as you guys pointed out. Okay, very last thing, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm happy to stay, but uh, more questions. But what I'll say is that MLPs, we don't need MLPs after, that's kind of interesting. Um, we, you don't need you don't need MLPs with uh, transformers either. Um, in fact, you, you use them basically because they're very high utilization. They, they're very efficient on hardware. It's interesting to point out that we could have models that are just that long chain of, um, of gates and diamond frequency domain, and they, they would do pretty amazing things. Uh, from just a, in the conceptual standpoint, I find that pretty satisfying. Um, the role of projections is uh, very, very, uh, it's extremely important and it's it's a bit, um, we're over-indexing on other uh, uh, aspects, unfortunately, uh, but I wanted to sort of balance that a little bit today. Multiple heads, so you can have some kind of mixing across D within a single line operator. You don't need to only use projections to mix across the embedding width. You can do, um, you can use the H3 approach, which does a bunch of uh, outer products. We're exploring different architectural choices there, but um, I am very confident we haven't found the best. Uh, we haven't yet found the best um, instantiations of the of, of IENAs and, and, and Safari models. And then interestingly, we don't use normalization. So you recall the beta uh, T denominator on the linear tension formulation. We don't use that, um, which means we're not applying any kind of running uh, normalization. Uh, that's interesting. It, it trains nonetheless. We don't really observe uh, big instabilities, but it may be another avenue uh, of, of of improvement. So with that, um, I don't think I have time to go. Uh, we had some slides on fast inference and genome, and like million context length in genome. Oops, what happened? Not sure. Uh, let's wait. Maybe Michael will rejoin. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hopefully he has Zoom open. Oh yeah. He's back, yeah. Yep. Sorry, ah, sorry, something happened. I'm back. So with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll conclude Then I'm happy to um, to take the questions for people that want to stay a bit longer or not. Uh, yeah, for what I recall, we have like 30 more minutes uh, for questions within the time slot. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, thank you very much, Michael, for presentation. And uh, let's then probably get to the questions. Does anybody want to have a question straight ahead? Or raise your hands, folks. If uh, I say, if you have questions about other things I mentioned, so uh, I have some slides on vision. Some on long context in genomics, one million context length, and some on efficient inference. If you have questions on those, I'm happy to just answer with some of those. Uh, okay. If you want. In, in, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, Michael, thank you so much. It was a very, very detailed and uh, insightful presentation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, hardware parallelism and how, what are the speed ups that you guys obtain with hyenas? Um, and what are some of the what are some of the kinds of parallelism that you can express in hardware? Mm -hmm. For sure. So this is um, um, it's something we we didn't address head on, other than uh, essentially saying the FFT doesn't doesn't map uh, very well to hardware and, and measuring runtime. We find okay, so. I should be approach this. Um, okay, so in, in our training of, uh, first we'll just say some, some observations. <clears throat> what we find is that if you match in parameters and you train in shorter sequence lengths, so say 2K for, for many of the natural language models today are training 2K sequence lengths, uh, the training throughput uh, without uh any essentially any custom kernel really uh, is is about 10 percent lower than a fully optimized um, transformer base so that's using fused everything it's using flash attention 
for a maximum utilization of, of uh, the attention operator with tiling and, and, and caching and so on. It's, it's fusing the bias and, and, and drop out and all that layer norms. Uh, so that's pretty promising. Uh, of course, there's still a gap, right? So ideally it would be much better also to put training throughput because that's really, if, if we can, um, if we can show a higher training throughput than and and similar quality then that's basically the green light for everyone to just switch to these uh, at scale essentially uh, so some ideas here are um going to the fft level that's very tricky so we need to look at basically we need to do better than nvidia with fft or work with them uh, and i say that it, it, may, it may seem impossible because the fft is such a low studied algorithm and it's, nvidia's are the best uh, cool engineers However, there, there are many choices, and depending on the hardware um, that we have, the, the trade-offs are different here. It's the FFT that we need within an IENA model is different than the FFT that maybe a computational, um, like a vision person may need for some other algorithms. Okay. So there's hope there. There's also hope in uh, rewriting, in generalizing the FFT and rewriting that as a, as a series of uh, matrix multiplications. There's work on this coming out over the summer. And so you're basically paying a memory cost for uh, higher utilization and uh, higher training throughput. Um, we, for this, we use, we leverage uh, some previous work on Monarch matrices, also from our group, um, which are these uh, butterfly-like matrices that can ex express, if you chain them, they can express many, many structured matrices like the DFT matrix and others, the discrete cosine transform matrix, uh, a lot of other things. And if you use that, you can define what's called the monarch convolution, basically, and, and uh, which put its corresponding transform and for the eigen composition. And that's one way. The other way would be to go to pa the parallel scan uh, line of things. And we're testing right now, uh, I think on the shorter term, that would be, I'm sure there would be uh, other work coming out on that. That will certainly be the way to go if you want to train, uh, if you want to scale, without writing any custom kernels today you might want to basically look if you look at the s5 paper and the code they have a some results for ie s5 so that i think in jax um like Alice, that would be I think the highest uh, training throughput achievable minimal tweaking so those are for the lower level um now there's also higher level parallelism in terms of architecture uh, architecture design and I mentioned one uh, about the projections so uh, for the this matters quite a bit um, I'll quote some work on um, from the Eleuther AI group where they when they train GPT neo models uh, GPTJ in particular and I think I think this is also in, in Palm or some other architecture there's this idea of, of, of the parallel update parallel attention um, thing where you, you perform uh, MLP, you apply the MLP and the, uh, the attention uh, to the same input instead of sequentially. And that saves you an all reduce operation, yeah, which is, we can be expensive depending on your setup. So pa parallelizing things in that sense may be another way to increase throughput. In, for AENA, that would just, that would essentially involve trying to do as many projections as you can in one go. Um, so the same idea, just have the same input and check them. We don't know what the trade-off in quality is yet. Uh, there's there's some choice. So if you increase the order, you do more projections in parallel. Yeah, I wish I could tell you more certainty, uh, but that's an axis that might be interesting to, to pursue. I think that covers everything. Unless you have something else in mind for parallelism. It's at least what, what we thought about. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's exciting that you are thinking about how what's the trade-off with the uh, improving runtime and throughput versus accuracy as you are running some of this in parallel. And we, we love, uh, we're also trying to think about how maybe some better evaluation. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently in the community how parameter matching or just flop matching is not the best way to evaluate models. Maybe maybe as, an, as academics, we can sort of help clarify some of that. Uh, like define this Pareto or space Pareto front where you have training budget, inference budget, 
because maybe there's something you just only care about inference budget, right? So you, you're willing to pay higher training costs and, and that, that would skew comparisons immensely towards um, SSM-based models, for example, or current IENA type models when they come out. Uh, hopefully that will clarify a bit the spaces. I see. Uh, yep. Laura. All right. As in, I would like to ask a couple of questions on my own. So if you could go back to the beginning of your results where you suggest synthetic, uh, yeah, sure. these ones. So I wonder, I mean, basically, if I understand correctly, the mechanistic design benchmarks uh, try, basically try to capture part of the language modeling, not only like, uh, like of how language works with these mechanistic be benchmarks. So I wonder if there are any works, maybe not your lab, but some other labs, uh, some other groups, which try to delineate which kind of tasks could work as a mechanistic benchmark, like a, a bigger set of mechanistic benchmark one should try their new model against. I, I would like to point to towards a, a work. I think this is basically other than the, so the, the way at least we see the literature here is that there is mechanistic interpretability work that looks at capabilities and how they're implemented. I think beyond the H3 and IENA and works, this hasn't been yet used for design of models um, anywhere. Uh, we, on our own, we, we have a lot of ideas. So I, ideally you design something that's maximally correlated with the, uh, with the scaling results you care. And so you could do it in a very, you could design the mechanistic design benchmarks in a very mechanistic way. So just go back uh, iteratively. So you care about scaling on the stack or something, you care about code models. These would also have some kind of correlation. You want to draw a scaling curve, for example, you can go back and forth until the correlation is, is it's like smaller models is, maximize and then you try extrapolating basically. So that would be another way maybe uh, as opposed to the uh, new uh, parameterization techniques from Microsoft to try and set um, hyperparameters or, or architectural choices without training at scale. We want to explore this further. So maybe in the next year we'll see something from us. Hopefully some someone else also picks up the, the, the idea. Um, the, the, the interesting or something else I mentioned is that these appear to be also informative of performance beyond language. So it just seems like these are language specific, but it turns out that they're also informative for like vision, which is kind of weird, but we train IENAs on the image net. They also match transformers, but we didn't do any tuning at all. Like the architecture that we, when we were exploring with this mechanistic design, we we're thinking about language. So we went, we went back and forth a couple of times on language. We never touched uh, vision until the very end. It was like a plus one experiment. So, okay, let's see. It would be fun to match vision transformers on image now. We just took the same thing, the same hyperparameters, and he transferred. So it may just be that when you have a, a model like transformers that is so successful across modalities and just works on tokens, it may be that really just language. Language is like the most, uh, it's just a series of tokens. So that's kind of interesting. That's super exciting to hear. And uh, like looking a little bit deeper into that, is there, did you have any chance to do some kind of ablation experiments in the kind of like, did you have a chance of look at a model which say does all of these mechanistic tasks well, except for say, I don't know, counting, and then try to use it uh, as a language model, maybe not on the pile on some small data set, so I'm just trying to gauge how how much impact does uh, a performance on each of these mechanistic uh, benchmarks uh, it has. Yeah, that's a very well uh, thought out experiment. We really really have the, <laughs> the time or space to do that. Um, hopefully, that's part of some some future future work. It may be it's actually certainly the case that some of these are less uh, predictive or correlated. Um, for a lot of these, we went with intuition, so just. Say, say something more here. Recall seems to test something about the, like the precision of your model in some sense. You need to go back and how far away you can look back. But we also wanted to test uh, more fuzzy or, or things that would require H of you to be more like denser or 
structured in different ways. And this is what majority, for example, accounting were supposed to be for, but you need to look at, you need to attend to many tokens basically at the same time. Um, but that's, that's as far as we went. Uh huh. Thank you. So, okay, couple more questions, which are maybe a little bit more tangential, but I would love to know your opinion on that. So I wonder, did you have a chance to compare performance of your module with something like an Former with transformer, which uses some, like say an Former uses KNN uh, and index, basically it's a wrap for a transformer, and which is claimed to also be able to process any kind of input lines, but they try the, themselves on a very different kind of task. They basically try to summarize a book and stuff like that. So if you had a chance could, to explore. Could you say again, the um, which model? So we, we tested against, um, we have some linear attention, Linformer. I think we have uh, Linformer, we have AFT comparisons. Uh -huh. but which, which model? Um, this one is very new, Unlimit Former, but basically I, I wonder, see, yeah, yeah. Basically, I wonder whether testing for transformer is kind of some kind of wrap, which yeah, Igor may may be able to clarify. Yeah, I think I think that paper came came out after, so it should be. There's been since we released this, um, um, and uh, tangentially, a lot of uh, big context models from Anthropic and, and other labs came out also this year around the same time, like slightly after, and so the academia also followed further and there, there, there are maybe four or five there are some hierarchical methods for long context there are some uh, block recurrent new block recurrent methods again we don't really know we, we don't have heads that to heads comparisons uh, i just mentioned that hierarchical and, and, and recurrent methods that you apply to transformers you can also apply here you go to even longer context if you want so this is maybe concerning the efficiency of a single block but yeah, we don't know. We even we even don't know how to evaluate long context performance specific like that. Well, beyond maybe looking at these uh, memory recall, uh, simple task summarization. But yeah, um, but then uh, I also find a lot of those papers don't really like. Some of them were about um, fine tuning, like not training, say at a million length taking an existing transformer and then extending sequence length. So maybe the application is slightly different. Uh, I'd love to, to see more work on that. Oh yeah, I had a question along the same lines. So is transformers now can handle with flash attention? They can handle quite long sequences also. And uh, currently, there are like no benchmarks uh, for long sequences, except maybe for long range arena, which is more or less solved already. And the sequences do not look that long right now. Uh, and I have like the same problem that I want something to evaluate uh, models that, that can handle longer pieces of code, because we have like one that we develop now. And there is no benchmark of which I can use. So do you have any tasks uh, in your mind which may require not only like 10th of southern tokens, but like millions tokens that you mentioned as your scaling goal? Because uh, you language modeling is nice, but for language modeling, most of the time, you don't need that long memory. Uh, well, intuitively at least. And also, uh, is we have exponential decay here. So attending to very distant tokens might have very low uh, attention. Oh, how to call it? So yeah, do you have any specific tasks in mind that you won't ideally solve when you get to the models that you dreamt of? Yeah, so this is a great question. There are many things. I'll just I'll start with the exponential, the comment on the exponential. The exponential is tuned so that it reaches, if you want to do a million context, then it reaches the millions. So it's it will see everything it needs. Um, but yes, the it is really, it is a big issue. And so like evaluating is, is a big issue. For language, 
there are two paths. Um, so on, on the short term, we are trying to, we're working on maybe like a smaller long document data set ourselves that we can use. Uh, there, are, there are already summarization options for whatever. There are modalities that, are, so ideally you'd want to test uh, on a modality that, or on a data set where a small local change verifying the past can have global effects. That would be the most, the most challenging. And that sounds like code. It also sounds like, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like genomics, DNA. Genomic is the same thing because uh, if you change one nucleotide, that can, have, that can change the whole, the way your DNA expresses everything. And that's kind of why we went with DNA because it was, we have already data sets and the, the, the models we, we could train, uh, the easier to, to, uh, to, uh, to train at the scale that was the large scale at the time. So one option is to test, if you, just, if you have a new architecture for long context that you design, um, I think it, it is fruitful to go even on other modalities, I think architectures transfer modalities if they're designed the right way. So there's nothing wrong to maybe go into genomics and just taking an off the shelf model. I I would love to have a long context code, uh, like a curated set of tasks in code where um, where we have this. Uh, maybe we can work together on huh? <laughs> stuff. We're doing something in language. But yeah, it's it's mostly what I find unsatisfying is that a lot of these papers do something. Um, um, each paper does its own thing because I guess it's easier that way. And and we we really run the risk of um, decoupling, like detaching further from uh, closed labs like OpenAI and Anthropic. We we become unable to even even now with short context, we're unable to really compare against GPT four say relink capabilities we use gpt4 to evaluate our models which is pretty funny we run the risk of, of doing the same mistake for long context capabilities memorization capabilities and to further co complicate this issue is is retrieval is in the mix in a lot of these models so it's it's long context within a layer mixed with some kind of retrieval from from a database that's also typically Q, uh, projection based and so this makes the problem really challenging uh, so my suggestions what we try to do is Ignore the closed APIs because we don't, it's, it's pointless. We don't know what they mix. And second, maybe let's do more work on benchmarks. Uh, those are what we're trying to do. Happy to take suggestions, but do I request? Uh, yeah, it, it would be nice to discuss it further, but not now, but in the nearest future, because we actively, I guess, we'll actively investigate what to do uh, in terms of long range tasks for code and there are some ideas but yeah it would be nice to cooperate here a short question you mentioned that you use gpt4 to evaluate your models if i didn't mis mishear you so could you please elaborate oh, no, no, oh. i was in the, the literature a lot of the literature for evaluating uh, generally so like ah. a, a rank models uses gpt4 as a scoring Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't catch that. Okay. Uh, any other question, folks? Yes, I think I have a question. Um, so maybe you could, uh, that's kind of a general question, but maybe you could describe some problems that you have faced. Uh, and maybe some dead ends uh, with your approaches. Uh, uh, just an open question. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, we could stay here. Uh, how much time do we have? Um, so in short, there's, I think the, the biggest open question is also what we struggled most with recently is um, training with our current well understood um, stack of Adam like optimizers and cosine warm up, linear warm up, cosine decay schedules, and all that. And longer sequences, uh, millions or more. Um, there appears to be, there, there appear to be, right, for DNA, um, we had to use fairly simple ideas, but um, we found that those went a long way. For example, uh, sequence like length warm up. 
which was also proposed in the context of transformers, I think a couple of years ago, that makes training a lot more stable, for example. Uh, I, I think that suggests that we, maybe that not that the whole optimization stack is to tweak for, for a longer context, but that the deeper parameters are way, way off as we go to millions and beyond. And this resonates with you know, the, the start magic, the startup that they trained the five, the five million context length. Uh, they said publicly on Twitter, so I'm not revealing any information. They said they developed a um, a, a new parameterization like uh, strategy for their own architecture in house to tweak upper parameters without keep training models at scale. So that may be a hint that the hyper parameters are quite far off. GPT right now in academia we take GPT three hyper parameters basically when we train models. Oh yeah, okay, uh, <laughs> decay whatever. Uh, six ten, uh, ten to the minus four uh, peak uh, learning rate. So that's one challenge, and to really chart the space of an architecture requires a very substantial effort, um, computational and otherwise. Oh. So that makes me hopeful that if we match with just taking other hyperparameters, we may be able to be much better. And so we're just we're basically just seeing the beginning of maybe like a flourishing of uh, new architecture work. We're going beyond transformers finally with these uh, first few ideas. Oh, at this point, maybe I can advertise my own paper. So basically, we did a piece on how do optimizers impact uh, and different options in uh, training setup impact performance. We did that for Kyoto, and the study was quite limited. But I think that one very quite reasonable takeaway, at least for the Kyoto is that the, the relative performance of optimizer is kind of stable with respect to data set size. So you can try to find, like, you can try several different optimizers on like 1% of your data set or even maybe even less. And then you can ex extend to the whole data set. And at least according to what we found, it's fairly stable. I mean, if the optimizer was in top three out of say 25 we tried, it's gonna stay in the top three. And- Stable meaning um, the ranking between optimizers is yeah, the, continuous yeah, the ranking, as you extend the data set. Yeah, the ranking is relatively stable. And I think there was a, awesome. a, a similar paper on that published at ICSI, but I can't, uh, at, at the latest ICSI, but I don't recall it by now, where they also experimented with the hyperparameters. We tried like different vanilla uh, optimizers, ADAM, R, ADAM, DevGrad, whatever. And those folks experimented with hyperparameters. And I, I'm just not sure, but I think there is a somewhat substantial literature on how to uh, fiddle with optimizers. And I think there are some suggestions for how can you try hyperparameters out in, a, in an efficient way. So that might be interesting for you. Yeah, those are really interesting findings on uh, most scaling laws <laughs> that uh, we, go, we, we can chart our own scaling laws without really training a ton of models. Uh, but that, that was one. One challenge was to sequence length and how the, the interplay with optimization. One simple idea of sequence length for map that seems to work. Um, the I mean the the other challenge is is really once you go to slightly unusual operations, at least in the context of deep learning, to very box standard like FFT. But having something that works well and systematically stable, especially when you implement your own versions, is is quite challenging. So. Um, that may also be something that limits our current um, design space a bit as we figure out, as we work within what PyTorch gives us a lot of the time. Uh, so we just use FFTs, but there are many other, if you go to uh, look at other fast transforms, there are many other very cool ideas, wavelets, uh, like extensions to the, to the Fourier transform. Uh, those require even more weeks to be stable and bring training and but you know that is not to say that it wouldn't work uh, thank you uh folks are there any other questions we are almost hitting the time limits but maybe there is a time for one or two quick questions can i ask a question uh, about the context size uh so uh as I understand, you're training on uh, the regular context size. 
but what if your data set is like small, big, medium, something like this? Do you know anything about it? Oh, sorry, what was it? Yeah, we, we train on, uh, for language, we train on uh, 2000, just to compare so the same uh, context time. That's uh, uh, my question uh, was, uh, what if the uh, size uh, of examples are not consistent? Uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get it. Um, so that's not a, um, it's not a, an issue for, so that's not an issue for for attention, right? Because as long as within your batch you have the same size, um, the self attention operation is basically flexible, right? To different sequence lengths uh, as you train, um, because you have weight tying across the sequence length in the projections. Uh, the same is true for for Aina and and these models you skating. So you can have variable lengths across batches during training, and uh, it all works out uh, fine. Yeah, thank you. I guess this is the time to finish. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for your talk and for your insightful answers. We were super happy to host you. And yeah, I'll stop the I'll stop the recording now. Uh,